Good morning, Bethel. Thank you so much for being here. This morning is going to be an interesting topic this morning. We're going to be in Luke, the eighth chapter. You know, ladies and gentlemen, God's more powerful than anything. God's power is way, way, way better and stronger than any kind of evil power that might be existing out there. And so this morning, I know that the, we're going to go over this in Luke, the eighth chapter. We're going to see how God broke the shackles, the chains off of a man that was demon possessed. And then what did this man do? Stick around with me this morning as we read from Luke, the eighth chapter about we're going to talk about how God's more powerful than any evil powers that are out there. Thank you for joining us. You know, the, the power of God is, is evident, and we see that in our lives. We see that in our lives personally as the power of being saved. We see that in our lives daily as we, if we open our eyes and see the power of God and the miracles of God all around us. The power of God is when you see, see out into a beautiful sunrise or sunset, and you, you, you know that God made that. That's the power of God. 
when you look out and you see your loved ones, family, friends, and you see what God is doing in their life, that's the power of God, that you're able to get past and persevere and continue on when everyone and all the doctors said you're not supposed to. That's the power of God. The, the times that maybe you have lost a loved one or you have lost somebody close to you and you didn't know how you were going to carry on. But praise God today, you're carrying on by the power of God. This morning, we're going to read from Luke, the 8th chapter, about the power of God. The power of God is so, so strong, and it's, and it's, it's, in, it's, it's, it's in the world. Now, something that we're going to talk about this morning deals with spiritual warfare, if you will. It, 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 these deals with, uh, uh, with the spiritual battles that take place. It deals with, with, with both good and evil. And I know a lot of people are going, you know, I, I don't know if I really understand it. I really don't get this whole spiritual warfare stuff. I don't know if there's maybe spiritual things going on around us. I don't know about that. I can't see it. It's not scientific. And, and I get that. And that's probably a good little, uh, question to, to be able to ask. But we're, we're going to read this morning from God's Word and see how the, the power of God in the, in the spirit world was able to take care of business and about how a life was changed as a result of the power of God. And we, I'm excited about this this, this morning because uh, uh, this is all strip, scripture, 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 but it's amazing how the scripture tells a story. And all it needs to, as for us is to be able to glean out of that. It's called expository preaching. That means to be able to get the word of God and just pull it out. And so that's what we're going to do this morning as we're going to be reading from Luke, the 8th chapter. Now in Scripture here, as we're going to pick up uh, this morning, we're in Luke, the 8th chapter. I want you guys to also know that this story is found in Matthew, the 8th chapter, as well as Mark, the 5th chapter. And there's just small little variations in each that we're going to kind of glean out from all of them. They all have either a shortened version of this or a elongated version of this same story. Um, but we're going to pick up in Luke the 8th chapter because I believe this particular passage of scripture it really speaks to me and hopefully it's going to speak to you as well. I'm going to be reading from the, uh, the uh, Christian Standard Bible this morning. First things as we get started, ladies and gentlemen, God's power is stronger than any evil power out there. It really, God's power is stronger than any evil power. And, and I want us to, to understand that first and foremost because sometimes we falsely give the devil too much credit to say that he is on par with God. That is erroneous. Uh, nobody's on par with God. Uh, there's, there is God and everything else is below God including the, the devil and all of his evil uh, minions and forces that are out there. And yes, sometimes in society, we always, you know, you always hear about the, 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 the devil on one soul shoulder and the angel on, on the other shoulder, and you kind of, you know, all this kind of imagery that they, that they want us to understand and to, to kind of get a point across. I guess if we do that, then, then we could say, okay, that we get the point across. We understand it's the good and bad both speaking into your life. And there's nothing wrong with that. But understand that, that there's nothing that compares to God. All right. Nothing. There's nothing, there, there's nothing that compares to God. Um, including batteries that I run out of like all the time. <laughs> all right. So, all right. I'm going to use my teacher voice this morning. So first things first, I want us to understand the spirit world is real. The spirit world is real. There's, there are, and the Bible talks about it all the time. The, as, as the spirit world is real. Let's pick up this morning in Luke the 8th chapter. Uh, verses 26 and 27. It says this. Then they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. Who is they? They being the, the disciples and Jesus. Kind of putting this in perspective, and if you flipped back over and saw what took place in, in, uh, uh, in Mark, the fourth chapter, is it's at nighttime, they, they, it's, it's pitch dark, and as, as it's pitch dark, here it is, that, that Jesus got into the boat with his disciples, and, and then they jumped in the boat, and they're going across the lake, and what happens a very night right before this is it's pitch black dark, 
and the waves are hitting the boat. We all know the story. And then they, they kind of were kind of drawing straws, if you will. Who's going to wake Jesus up? We're fixing to die in the middle of the night. And Jesus, they, they go and they wake Jesus up. And they're like, uh, we're fixing to die. It's uh, waves are hitting the side of the boat. Jesus calmed the storm. When Jesus calmed the storm, the disciples were amazed, saying, who is it that this man that can calm the storm? We're going to read about this man that not only calms the storm, but comes in and saves the lives of people. This morning, we're going to read how the Jesus, the same Jesus, walks into this pitch black night and go and saves the life of a demoniac. Now, if God can save the life of, of a demoniac, can he not save the life of anybody? Yes, sir. Absolutely, anybody? So as we read here and pick up here the story, it's pitch black. They're coming to shore. As, they, as they're coming to shore uh, in, in, in the land here, this is where we pick up the story this morning. How they're, they're going opposite of Galilee, on the other side of the lake of Galilee. Verse 27, when, when he got out on land, a demon-possessed man from the town met him. For a long time he had no, wore no clothes, and he did not stay in a house, but he stayed in the tombs. Now, this region here of Gersines is, uh, uh, is probably around the, the town of, of Gergisa, uh, also known as, as Hersa, and it's on the eastern coast city, uh, of, uh, the, city of Ga of the Sea of Galilee. And as he gets out, he jumps up, gets on the land, gets out of the boat, it's pitch black, and this demon-possessed man runs up. Scared? I imagine that the apostles, the disciples, that they just were scared at waves hitting a boat, and it's pitch black at night, and here's this demon-possessed man running up to them. Was the disciples scared? I bet that they were. I would be. You just talked about that, kind of alluding a little bit to it. This is a whole lot worse than even that story. So as this happens, I want us to know here that the, this demoniac, that the spirit world is real, this demon-possessed man from this town went out to meet Jesus. Went out to meet Jesus. Now, this man was an outcast. He was put outside the town. He, he was a demoniac. demoniac. He was possessed. He, 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 we don't know what caused his possession. And let me ask you this, or let me just tell you this this morning. When we talk about maybe that, hey, maybe, uh, I don't know if demon possession really is alive and well in 2020. I, I believe it is. I believe that, that, that people are possessed, that people have demonic spirits inside of them today. There's all these kinds of evil things that take place. Now, Now I'm not talking about mental illness. That's a whole new topic for another th another thing. And, and I'm not talking about mental illness on here. I don't believe that that's what the Scripture is talking about here. Uh, that's, that's something else. What this is talking about is a, a, a demon-possessed individual. How does someone get demon-possessed today? Well, let me tell you a few things. One is entertaining evil, evil spirits. When you entertain evil spirits in various different ways, you are entertaining darkness. When you entertain darkness, it says throughout Scripture, don't do such things. Don't mess around with sorcery. Don't mess around with the dark magics. Don't mess around with evil things. Don't mess, mess around with sexual lust or sexual immorality or, or drunkenness. Or these, uh, don't mess around with that. Don't mess around with enviness or, or, or being a braggart or all these kind of things. Don't mess around with those things. When you allow those negative things, when you allow the sin things in your life, that's who you become. I heard Dr. Tony Evans say this one time when I, I heard him way back when at a, at a Promise Keepers event. He says inside of us is two dogs. There's a, there's a, there's a, the, 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 which the dog is a good side and a dark side, a, a good, a good side or an evil side. He said whichever one you feed the most is the one that's going to get the biggest. So inside of us, there's dark and light, if you will. We, we are a, how do you get the dark? Well, because we are a sinful people. Thanks to Adam and Eve. I don't want to pick on Eve, but, you know, Eve's the one that kind of did everything that 
Yeah, those women. <laughs> anyway, that's another start. That's another sermon for another time. Um, anyways, but what you see here is is, is 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 in our lives. We can entertain darkness, and when you entertain darkness, you allow and invite lesions, if you will, in some cases, which is, means thousands. But you invite darkness, demons, one at a time, two at a time, ten at a time, hundred. We don't know. But every single time you dabble with things, you're inviting darkness in your life. That's right. Don't do it. Amen. Now, I know that there's not a single one of us that say, you know, I'm going to jump smite dab right in the middle of this darkness, the demonic stuff you're talking about, and invite all of them in. It doesn't happen that way. It happens slowly. And one at a time, and one at a time, and pretty soon, you if you don't stand for something, you fall for anything, as the saying goes. But if you're not standing up, and standing up to the, the, the sin that is, is abounds in your world and in our lives, then we are, in effect, inviting things in. We can't do that. Now, sometimes things, we invite things in, and as I talked about this two weeks ago, we don't mean to let, let that happen. We don't mean, we, we've got to kind of do some self-retrospective thinking and go, uh, is that really what I'm doing? Is that, and I'm really doing that? Or God, open my heart, open my mind, because I might be sinning against you, and I don't want to do that. And I believe as long as we're open and honest with God, God's open and honest and shows us, and we that's how we are fighting those battles. And when you fight those battles, that's the key. That we are, in fact, fighting battles against evil. Amen. If you're battling, praise God. Amen. Because you're not sitting back on your heels saying, oh, poor pitiful me. Right? You've got to be battling. You've got to be fighting. Ephesians 6 all talks about fighting. <laughs> About putting on the armor of God. We are to battle it out against the forces, forces of evil. we got to come to Jesus. That's exactly what this demoniac did. He came to Jesus. <laughs> when he comes up to the land here, and he walks over to Jesus, because he had no clothes on, he, he was living in tombs, he, he, he was something that was a real, real strong man. Let's, let's, let's continue on this. The demoniac went to Jesus here in verse 28 and 29. When Jesus, when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him and said in a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, son of the most high God? Now, isn't that interesting? Hmm. <clears throat> the devil... The demonic forces recognized who he was. The religious Jews were battling him to say, you ain't the most high God. You are not who you say you are. That's what they kept battling over and over. <coughs> Matter of fact, not a people as a popularity gained, but but at particular times they not a whole lot of folks were knowing this, wanting to follow this. They had questions about this. The demons said, what do you want with me? Specifically says, son of the most high God. I beg you, don't torment me. Verse 29. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Many times that it seized him and Though it would, he was guarded, bound by chains and shackles, he would snap the restraints and be driven out by the demons into a deserted places. It's a matter of fact, if you, if you flipped over in Mark, Mark talks about how he was so strong that the man could not even control him. There, it, would be, it would bring uh, people to come and try to control this man and to, to put the shackles on him, on his hands and his feet. And he was so strong because of his demon possession, was so strong that he would, that he would break that iron just like twigs. That no, that the men, lots of men could not even control him. Henceforth, they pushed him out of these caves. You see, when the devil gets a hold of you, it's powerful. That's right. When the devil gets a hold of men and women, it's powerful. 
It's not something to tinker around with. I was talking to somebody the other day. Somebody that was a, a, says a self-proclaimed ag, agnostic doesn't believe in heaven or hell. As I was talking to this individual, I was actually refreshed that this person felt comfortable enough to talk to me. Because I, I want to talk to people about Jesus. If you don't believe, that's all the more why I want to talk to you. I've talked to people that has, has also talked about being demonic, being in the witchcraft. Being part of that society has entertained those things. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, you might not think that it's here, but it's here in your world where you live. It's in Hobbes, Lovington, Knowles, it's all around here. You may think to yourself, ah, that only happens in big cities or here, here, here. No, wrong. It's right in front of you. Yes. It's around you. It's, it is where you, where you live. And so these people, they have no idea what it is that they're dealing with and the destruction that they're dealing with. And as I'm talking with these individuals, I, I want to just share with them that I pray for the, re the, the reason why I share with them, the reason why I talk to them, because I believe in what we're reading this morning, that God's power is stronger than anything else. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And if God wants to call the people that I'm talking to that believe in all these other things that are apart from God, then if God wants to, he can call them, take them, write them in there, change their lives right then and there. That's right. Amen. But it takes us being obedient, right? Yes. It takes us being obedient to that. Well, what do we see here? We see in Scripture, we see that the man came to Jesus, and when he, when he, he identified Jesus as the son, son of the Most High God, and he says, don't torment me. Now, Continue on here when he says he's bound by by uh, uh, chains and shackles and he snapped them and and, and uh, they he was driven out to these places. Verse thirty. Jesus asked him, "What's your name?" Now we don't know if Jesus is asking the the name of the man, but the demon answered. The demon answered. The demon said, "Legion." Which is a demonic name. Legion. So the demon answered and spoke on behalf of the man. That's intense. So here it is. The man was there. The demon was speaking to God. His name was Legion. Why? Because they had many demons inside of them. Legions. Whenever you read about legions, you have legions of... Uh, the Roman soldiers had uh, uh, legions. They were uh, when Roman soldiers had think about legions of, of Roman soldiers. Um, uh, there would be thousands, and there's different numbers associated with that. But we're just going to go with thousands of, uh, of of soldiers. When they talk about legions of soldiers, right here with this this demoniac, uh, when, he's, when, when Jesus is talking to the demon himself inside here, legions, thousands, if you will. Verse 31. And they begged him not to banish them to the abyss. This is very interesting, ladies and gentlemen. The abyss. He's begging them to, to, to he's begging them to not sentence them to the, the Hades side, the, the abyss, the, the side of a of, of place where, where there's 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 demonic angels. In the abyss, in Hades, in the the in in uh, the the the, uh, the temporal hell, if you will. That's what these demonic angels are saying. Don't sentence me there. There's some that's already there. Don't sentence me there. And he says from the next step here that he doesn't do that, but he also is going to command them. So it's very interesting. He says that they, they, they begged him not to, 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 to banish them to the abyss, the, 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 the compartment, the, the temporal hell. The reason I say it's a temporal hell because the lake of fire has not been, been made yet. 
And you find that over in uh, Revelations 20, 21, 22. Okay? Verse 32. A large herd of pigs was there feeding on the hillside. Now, if you went over to Mark, Mark puts this number at 2,000. 2,000 pigs. Now, we got a little problem there. <laughs> There's two explanations. One is, see, Jewish folks can't have pork. 2,000 pigs. You guys making a connection yet? So either these were some backsliding Jewish folks that were more concerned about the pocketbook than they were following God. Okay? Or maybe they were in they were in, there were some Gentiles there that could have the pigs that were in the land that that would make everything kosher. You see what I did there? <laughs> Some of you guys didn't get it. That's okay. That's okay. So, but anyways, what's happening here, there's 2,000 pigs, and, and what's happening here is, is this large herd of pigs here, they're feeding on the hillside, and the demons here in verse 32 of Luke 8 says, here, a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside, the demons begged him to permit them to enter the pigs. And he gave him permission. If you went over to the book of Job, whenever the devil went to God and God pointed out Job to get tested, get tried, God had to permit that to happen to Job. That's right. Yes. Do you hear, we, we were just read here in, in, in Luke 8 that God had to give permission to the legions of demonic angels, demonic spirits, demonic beings. Had to give permission. Henceforth, the time of this sermon, God's powers are way more important, way more powerful than any evil forces whatsoever. Right. So, I get tired of hearing this, to be honest with you. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it. In some cases, maybe, I believe in 90% of the cases, you do it and blame it on the devil. That's yeah. Just being straight up with it. That we go off and we do some nonsense, some, some boneheaded stuff that we shouldn't have done, and, and then it's really easy for, a month, for me to, to have a real quick out or the devil, devil made me do it. Hey, wait a minute here. The, the devil is not stronger than God. If I'm a child of the Most High God, then, then, then God is, is overseeing me. If, if that, in fact, had to happen, then work with me on this. If the devil, in fact, made me do it, then that means God allowed me to be tested or tried. Mm. Now, that's big. That's big. Does that happen? Well, it's, it's, it happened in Scripture. It happened with Job. So does that happen? It happened in Scripture. Job went through some horrible stuff. I pray that, that God doesn't do that with me, to be honest with you. That's a horrible thing. We don't know. We all go through trials and tests in our lives. We don't know where that's coming from. And that's a sermon that I did about a year or two ago, a sermon series on that. We don't know, but we do know that God's more powerful than anything else. God delivered Job. God delivered me and you too. Right. Power. God's power. This demoniac went to Jesus. Then these demons came out of the man. Verse 33, the demons came out of the man. And they, they entered the, the pigs. 
And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and they drowned. You see, the demons might be strong, but God is stronger. Yeah. God's stronger. Now, this next point, I absolutely love this next group of scripture. I absolutely love because this is what takes place here. You know, we read last week about the two sisters, Mary and Martha, and about how we remember the whole, the, the, the frazzled sermon that we talked about. And we talked about how, uh, how uh, Mary went and sat at the feet of Jesus. Let's see what takes place here. So this, that Jesus cast the demons out of man. What does a man do next? I'm glad you asked. Let's read. Verse 34. When the man who tended them saw what had happened, they ran off and reported it to the town of the countryside. Absolutely. Absolutely. They saw this man. They know this man's been, been strong. He's been, he's been tormented. It says here in Scripture, uh, we talk about the torment. Uh, Matthew talks about the, the torment, uh, tormentation that he has. And so he, he's going through all this stuff. And so the people that saw it, the people are hurting this, the shepherds with the 2,000 plus pigs or whatever out there, that they all saw this, what happened. And as they saw all this event, yeah, they ran to tell people about it. Now we have a whole different set of scenarios here. The people from the town, we're going to read here in verse 35, then the people went out to see what happened, and they came to Jesus. So the people from the town, they word got around pretty fast. Do you remember so-and-so out there? Yeah. Because keep in mind, everybody knew who he was because of, of his antics. And so, if God can change this man, huh, God can change you and I like that. That's right. That's right. But you know what? When, when we are sinners, we are like this guy. We may not have all this craziness stuff going on, but we got all that craziness going on in our own lives. Yeah. Apart from God. We got all that craziness going on. They come out. They come out. They look at this man. And let's read here in Scripture what takes place. And they came out in verse 35. They came to Jesus and they found the man the demons had departed from. What was he doing? Sitting at Jesus' feet. Hallelujah. Sitting at Jesus' feet. We talked about that last Sunday. Whenever, whenever, whenever you, you want to, 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 to learn more about God, whenever you're humble towards God, whenever you, you know that in your life that, that you've done all that you need to do or all that you can do or you can't do no more, you've got to sit at the feet of Jesus. Whenever Jesus changes your life, you sit down at the feet of Jesus. That's exactly what this demoniac did. He had gone through, and it says here in Scripture that he put his clothes back on. He, he put it, he, he, he's a changed man. And he's changed man. What is he doing? He didn't run off and say, hey, uh, look what's going on now. Um, now, I, you know, he sat at the feet of Jesus. Now, we don't know how, this long, how long this man was, this demoniac was acting like this. We have no idea. But I guarantee you, if it was more than a day, he was probably have all this stuff going on in his mind. And when he's delivered, boy, I imagine that delivery right there. What a huge delivery that is. If you've been going through all this stuff in your body and all this stuff's been ravaged and, and, and then you have all these things, this tormentation going on inside of you, whatever you've got changed, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And then what do you do? You sit down at the feet of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, when you come to Jesus Christ, the same exact thing. You may not have all the chains and the shackles, but in, in effect, I think you do have chains and shackles. You may not be able to see them, but they're there on you. Without Jesus Christ, you are chained, you are shackled, you are doomed. And then, when Jesus delivers you, exactly like this man, the chains fall off. Amen. Those shackles fall off. You are a changed person in Jesus Christ. And then, you do what this old boy did. Button up his shirt. He wants to get presentable because he wants to respect Jesus. 
As he respects Jesus, he sits down at the feet of Jesus. Now, all these people from the town want us to see here, we have absolute opposite points of view on this. You have the people that this man has been tormenting. Uh, when you read over in, in the other, the other uh, in Luke and in Matthew as well, in Mark and uh, Matthew as well, you see here that, that this man has been like this. They couldn't handle him. I mean, a lot of stuff's been going on. If this has not been a popular guy, he's delivered. Don't you think that everybody would say, Hallelujah, praise God? You delivered him. I want to be delivered too. They don't say that. As a matter of fact, they say the exact opposite. They say to Jesus, get out of here. Go. They didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Why? He just changed the life of this man. And they saw this man at the feet of Jesus, and he's acting different. They heard the testimony from what the people that saw it firsthand took place. They saw it, they went and told them. Hey, keep in mind, they didn't have like cars. This took a little while to take to do, right? Like logistically, it took them a long time to go into the area, into the town, get everybody stirred up with what's going on. It took them a long time out. And can you imagine the stories that this man was talking about Jesus to being at his feet? We can only imagine, we can only speculate that it's not in Scripture here. But can you imagine when you have a changed life and you know exactly what I'm talking about. When your life was changed and you just spent time alone with God, and the things that you were thanking God for. Can't you feel that in your spirit? Can't you feel that in, the spirit, in your spirit what, what this man was thanking God for? <clears throat> right now, I feel that. Because I know what I thank God for. I know what God has done to deliver me. I thank God for that delivering spirit that he has sent to me. That he reached out to me. Did you notice that this man reached out to this demoniac? Uh, Jesus reached out to this demoniac. Jesus reached out. He was a changed soul. And then what takes place here is, is they tell him to leave. To leave. They want Jesus to leave. You see that they are good with their sin. They are good with, the, if, if, especially if, if they were Jewish people with the pigs and stuff, they, they were good with just playing church. They didn't want a real conversion. They didn't want a life change. They were good at being a Christian on Sunday and living like the devil Monday through Saturday. That's exactly these type of people. Did. What takes place, continuing on here in verse 35. They came to Jesus and found a man the demons had departed from, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Verse 36, meanwhile the eyewitnesses reported to them how the demon-possessed man was delivered. Then... All the people of the Gerasene region asked him to leave because they were gripped with fear. So getting back in his boat, he returned. And the man, the man who had absolutely nothing to, in this world, that he had everything was stripped from him. He, he was living among, in caves. He was, he, he was a man that was a, a demon possessed. He had absolutely nothing nothing in this world and his life was changed by Jesus and what did he do? He goes to Jesus in verse 38 here the man whom from the demons were depart, who had departed from begged him earnestly to be with him begged him earnestly why? when Jesus changed your life you want to be with him when you really know that you've been saved from your sin, you want to be with Him. And that goes to, to, to my, my point about salvation. 
Sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, you guys know as a, as a school teacher, uh, uh, the kids know that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. And so uh, from time to time, I have uh, students that, that will come to me and they're excited. And on a Monday morning, I always get their smart decisions. That's what I do every Monday morning. I've been doing this for a long time. I'll teach them to stand up and to shake hands firmly and look me in the eye and be able to communicate. I think that's a huge, important skill in life. And I teach, I've been teaching that for 18 years or whatever, for a long time. So, um, so as, that, as we do that every Monday morning, from time to time, I have students that would say, stand up and say, I've got saved over the weekend. And I say, awesome, fantastic, I'm proud of you. And then I ask him this question. What would you get saved from? And then I get sad. I don't say anything to them. But I get sad. Because there's people, both young and old in our midst, that supposedly get saved, but can't tell you what they're saved from. Amen. <clears throat> and as a pastor, <clears throat> that concerns me greatly. Right. Right. I can stand before you today and tell you that I'm burdened. I've, you know, I've, I've baptized in my lifetime. I've baptized, I added it up not so long ago, 80-something people or so. And I wonder, as I look out, I don't see very many in here. I look out and I wonder if they're serving God somewhere. I look out and I'm concerned. We never know who God saved and who doesn't. We go. We are to be obedient in that, and that salvation comes from God. But I just wonder, and I'm burdened. How many of those that have filled up the cards and have dumped in the tank that really didn't understand? Yeah. <clears throat> Not only at Bethel. But around this great world of ours. I got saved this weekend. Really? What did you get saved from? Anything apart? Anything, say anything apart from getting saved from my sins is wrong. That's what you're saved from. You're saved from your sins. It's like this, ladies and gentlemen. If you were in a swimming pool and you were drowning... And if, if, if you were drowning in that swimming pool and somebody was to the, to the side of you and had a life preserved and they pitched it out to you as you were taking in water and you're gasping for air and your muscles are cramping because you're trying all that you can to stay afloat and, you're, and that water's in your lungs and your lungs are burning and you are scared to death. Some of you guys have been there. You know what I'm talking about. Your heart rate is so fast. And then you get saved. When you get saved, when you get on the side of the, that, that swimming pool or lake or where, and that sit in that boat or whatever it is, and you know that you're saved, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that that person saved you. And you are appreciative of that. In a small way, I look at that to be like Jesus Christ. Unless we know that we are drowning in our sin, and unless we know that the only way for us to get that life preserver is through Jesus Christ, then we've got it all wrong. We've got it all wrong. If we don't know that, that life preserver is the only thing. This man wanted to go with Jesus. He said to this man that was demon possessed, when, when Jesus was departing, he begged him earnestly to let me go with you. But I want to know, I want us to focus in on here, and you can underline in your Bible in verse 39, our, our ending here, and it's so perfect. It says here that he sent him away, Jesus sent him away. He's the man begged, 
Jesus, earnestly, let me go with you. But he sent him away and he said, go back to your home and tell all that God has done for you. Go back to your home and tell everybody what God has done for you. Go and tell everybody what God has done for you. It should be on our lips. What does it say here in the scripture, the very last script, part of the scripture there? It says he did what? He ran. He went home. And he told everybody. Why? Because his life was changed. Ladies and gentlemen, God's power is greater than any evil force whatsoever. And when God's power is, has gotten a hold of you and broken those chains off of you and changed your life, you want to naturally sit at the feet of Jesus. And when you're sitting at the feet of Jesus for a period of time, that is wonderful. But there's going to be a point of time when you sit at the feet of Jesus and Jesus says to you, Go, get up, go and tell everybody what God has done for you. And we, ladies and gentlemen, inside this church and right inside this church, everywhere around this world, need to get outside these walls and go tell people Amen. what God has done for you. Amen. Amen. This morning is mistake. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, some of us here, we may have some evil... <coughs> Forces that are upon us. You may have different things in your life that is upon you pretty, pretty strong. But God's power is more strong than anything else. So I, I'm going to ask you this morning to, to cry out to God and ask God to deliver you from these forces that are pulling you one way or the other. Also, call upon God and ask Him to identify things in your life that you may not see with your own eyes but in the spirit world is causing you uh, consternation because you have some uneasiness in your spirit because you're supposed to be doing something or or God has you uh, doesn't want you to be a part of whatever that is it's taking you away from his service or getting your mind jumbled so Some of us, Jesus has broken off that shackle and we want to keep picking it up off the ground and putting it on our wrist saying that, no, that we, we want to be shackled. And God's saying, I have loosed you from that. But instead, we want to keep picking it up and putting it on because there's somehow comfort in that. Jesus is telling us, I'm taking the shackles off. Go and tell others what I've done for you. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, yeah, you may say, I've been, I've been in church all my life, but I've never really committed my life to Jesus. Do that today. Today may be the day you need to hit that reset button. You need to say, Lord, I need a, a do-over. I need a, a fresh start with you. Praise God, He's the God of fresh starts. If Bethel is where you need to call a church home or you need to come to the altar and pray or let me pray with you, you please be obedient to God and God alone this morning as we sing.